The first thing is, of course, whose Mark VI are they going to remake? <laughs> Hi, welcome to today's vlog. It feels ages since I last said those words. It probably actually is ages, especially in the studio. Uh, welcome along. It's been, I say, about two and a half weeks since I last did a vlog in the studio. In that time, we've been to Paris, uh, not only to visit the Selma factory, as so many of you have seen, and you've probably the reason you've tuned into this video today. Uh, also visited Sios, uh, visited the Normandy beaches, and of course have been making the film about my grandpa's Second World War, which is nowhere near ready. I started making the first pass-through of the edit last night, it's going to be a while till I get that finished, but thank you very much for all your questions. I'm going to come up with those, including the one about why Selma are not making this instrument anymore. You know, the classic question, why don't they make the Mark VI? What, what's been going on? Um, I want to apologise straight out the bat to a lot of you because we were intending to have a sit down and that was what was in the plan. It was what was kind of put down. When I got to Selma that week, it was the week of the heat wave in Paris. It was approaching kind of like 33, 34 degrees by like 11 o'clock in the morning. Barry is there. As the sun beats down on Paris, it's baking everyone who dares to defy it. Because it's like a sauna, you walk out and you're just dripping. Temperatures here hit the 90s today, and in parts of the country they soared above 100. And there's no aircon in there. It was baking, baking, baking hot. I could barely think. Uh, trying to remember everything else I needed to do while I was there, whilst also thinking about another video, of course, I was shooting. Um, it just meant that the, the thought of being able to get the sit-down organised just never really happened. Also, there wasn't really anywhere within the Selma factory that we could do it. We could have done it when we got back to Paris, but kind of things just overtook. But that all said, I did have a great chat with Florent in the car, uh, and also when we got went out for lunch in Paris. So I can relay some of those questions. I did ask a lot of the questions. I just didn't do them on camera. You know, it kind of, it was really stuffy and uncomfortable you know it's a very very hot week in Paris that week the day after the temperatures topped out at something like 41 degrees Celsius do the maths if you want to know what that is in old money but it was really really baking hot but I came away uh, with a great appreciation for what Selma Paris have done and continue to do in the world of saxophone a great appreciation also for why Selma saxophones cost so much money. And maybe that's a subject for another vlog, but you've got to remember that, you know, unlike horns being made in, um, in China or Taiwan or something else like that, or other places around the world where there isn't that sort of, there isn't the care for the employees, there isn't the holiday pay, all those kind of things. We'll talk about that another day. And also just the sheer skill of people. I mean, when you watch the video and you look at the traditional assembly line, you know, the fact it takes three years at least to train someone to do that and it's all done by hand and it can take up to four hours uh, to assemble the instrument. Just bashing the bell through the old traditional methods takes five hours, five hours of, of time, you know, kind of. So, you know, you could probably do one, two, well, you can't even really do two bells a day, can you? So. You know, it, it really made me appreciate kind of what we're paying for when we're paying top do top dollar or top mark for uh, for these great saxophones. Lots more to come. I just noticed as well the other day, I thought, do you know what, I haven't really mentioned it, and I certainly haven't linked it, so I will link it today. Remember that any of you, all of you, have access to four free video lessons from me on the Cambridge Saxophone website. So all you have to do, click the link below, go over to the Cambridge, award-winning, I should say, cambridgesaxophone.com website, which is mine. I've got over 400 award-winning video lessons on there. Go over there, sign up four free video lessons to you, no obligation, no kind of you have to pay anything up front or do anything else, all I need is your email to send that to you. Obviously I'd love it if you signed up for Platinum membership there, uh, and if you want to explore like, taking lessons with me, please do sign up on the waiting list and see what happens, but I haven't mentioned that in an awful long time, and I noticed kind of the visits have gone down a little bit, so there you go, four free saxophone lessons available to anyone, anytime, anywhere in the world you can access them. Speaking of which, I need to get my practice done. Mm-hmm. 
So why don't Selma make the Mark VI anymore? Well these are kind of discussions I've had with people over the years, especially uh, discussions I had whilst I was at Selma, and also a lot of thoughts. So these are not Selma's thoughts, these are my own personal thoughts. Uh, the first thing is of course, whose Mark VI are they going to remake? Because this Mark VI is very very different from even one that was just made a few years later, uh, as I showed you in that vlog I just pointed to. Now the first thing I'd say is of course a lot more of the process has become mechanised, it's become done by machine. So while you saw in the Selma video how the bell and the, uh, the body of a baritone or a bass saxophone is hand hammered, today that is now done by machine for alto and tenor saxophones. So it kind of rules out any imperfections, any kind of differences, anything that goes on in there. But as Florence said in that video, it's the neck and the mouthpiece and kind of where everything else is rather than the alloy and everything else that has more to do with the sound of the saxophone. And we discussed it at length over lunch and one of the things that, that I sort of kind of thought is, you know, there's a lot to be said for the power of perception and psychoacoustics, which is something I could go into in a whole different vlog. But when you see this Mark VI, this kind of former silver plated Mark VI with all the lacquer and everything else worn off it and it looks beaten up and it looks like it's seen some time and you've seen people like Michael Brecker playing saxophones like this and lots and lots of other great players playing that, you naturally, as a musician, you naturally have in your head a sound that you expect to hear from this horn. I think that's why kind of like brush, brushed brass or unlacquered horns are so popular these days, because we think in a way, we perceive, and because you are so responsible for making the sound, that therefore you might even make a darker sound with a different coloured saxophone. That's a whole different ball game. That's something else to go to. There is definitely a difference between the different saxophones. You can't deny that. Uh, why did Selman make the Mark VII one of you asked? Well, I guess they thought they were going to try and they wanted to improve it. They had processes they wanted to improve and the vast majority of people's opinion is that they didn't improve on the saxophone, that the Mark VI is still the standard to go by. Now there were a few processes that I wasn't allowed to film that were sensitive commercially, there's also a couple of things that I was asked to take out, more from the fact we didn't have permission uh, to use those uh, members of staff in the video, we need, would have needed to have got their signed consent to be able to have used those uh, those bits in the film, So, and also I was asked not to film some of the engraving as well, which is fair enough, that's what, what we did, you know, that's what I, I agreed to do in order to get that video for you because it's more important in a way to get around the factory. So there were a few processes that I couldn't show you. Um, some great questions that I've seen before that maybe I'll ask Selma back again, kind of what is their concept of sound? That's a great question. What are Selma looking for within the saxophone? There's certainly, uh, I, I get the feeling and I, I understand that Selma very much worked towards a more classical sound, a darker sound, a more centered, refined sound. Certainly most of the musicians I heard testing the Selma saxophones in the in the booths there were classical players, they weren't really jazz players, so they are certainly aiming down maybe towards more of a, a classical sound, certainly again within uh, the classical saxophone world, Selmas are kind of the ones that most people go for. And let me see, is there anything else? Um, yeah, I mean, the people were talking about, you know, these Asian uh, saxophones that have come in. Selma's biggest market, and that's very, it's not, not a secret, it's very open about it, is in Asia. It's very much in Asia, the top dog, you know, you want the top mark, you want to be able to purchase the best uh, quality, um, the best brand, as it were. Whereas um, in Europe and in America, uh, we're a bit more sensitive to price. Um, so we, we we're always looking, aren't we, for the deal. We're, we're kind of always looking, ah, there must be a better deal than this. It can't be, you know, uh, but the one big thing I took away from it is that there's no, it's no wonder that Selma saxophones cost so much money if, and this is another vlog to do, if you've kind of got, you know, over 400 employees, uh, you've got to give all those employees holiday, sick pay, you've got to train them all, you've got to give them all, you know, all the, um, European rights in terms of kind of, uh, uh, health and safety and all those kind of things have all got to be taken care of that in these cheaper markets uh, where, where some of the other horns are made, they're certainly not, as far as I'm aware, adhered to, certainly not paying their workers in a similar type of thing. But that's a whole kind of political macroeconomic argument that we can have of another day. Uh, so please save the comments for that. So I guess, in the age old comment, why to answer the original question of the vlog, why don't Selma make the Mark VI anymore? Because the Mark VI was an instrument made in the 1950s and 1960s. It's the same reason why Jaguar don't make the E-Type anymore. Um, it's one of those things. I, there's, there's definitely something to be said or some project PhD or film to be made about kind of 
what it really is about the Mark VI. Maybe I'll launch one day a Kickstarter or a Patreon and we'll make that film. And there's also another film I'd really love to do, which was the history of Selma during the war, because they were making some amazing saxophones kind of between 1935, maybe just before that, and the mid 60s. So kind of, that will be a great time to do uh, a video, I think, a film about, I'm gonna wonder where to put this right now, um, about those different things. So yeah, um, and then, you know, kind of for me, the contrast between what was going on at Selma, their history and tradition and what they've done over the years, and the disruption that Sios are doing to the mouthpiece market. It's quite a contrasting visit. Anyway, hope that helps. facing a World Cup final of cricket, hopefully. They need two runs, they've more or less definitely done it. Even me and my most pessimistic England fan mood cannot think we're gonna fail at this point. Quite incredible. And uh, once this is over, thank you very much for watching. Uh, make sure you check out previous vlogs and uh, I won't be around till Sunday, till hopefully England win the World Cup. That will be fantastic. Here we go. Oh. It's the problem with cricket, you never quite know when it's going to happen. Yes! yes! Get in England, see you soon.